If you would like a free newsletter on this or other subjects, just give us a call at Christian Answers. The phone number is area code 512-218-8022. That's 512-218-8022. Or you could email us at cdebater at aol.com. That's cdebater at aol.com. Thank you. Hello, I'm Jackson Boyette, pastor of Dayspring Chapel at 55th and Avenue G in Austin. We're a Reformed Baptist church located just two blocks south of Keenig Lane. And one of the things that we like to do is Bible study. So we're bringing you this program today called Understanding Your Bible. And the title is very deliberately chosen. There are a lot of people who own Bibles, but they're very unfamiliar with them. They don't understand them too well. Perhaps you've been given a Bible as a, a gift, a birthday gift, a graduation, a Christmas gift. Maybe it's gathered dust for a long time because it's a closed book to you. Well, the purpose of this program is for you to get out that book and dust it off and sit down and for about an hour uh, join me in taking a look at a passage of Scripture or two and begin to get some kind of understanding. In many ways, this program is very much like uh, programs on exercises or how to cook or things like that. It's a program that is designed to be somewhat interactive with you holding in your hands your own Bible. I would guess that the Bible that you probably own is a King James Version because that's the one that most households possess. But I would also uh, suggest that sometimes it's rather hard to understand that version written as it is in Elizabethan English. Therefore, I use the New King James Version, which preserves the rhythm and the cadences and the phrases of the King James Version, but also has a modernized language. Now, if you have an old King James, you'll be able to follow along very easily. But if you have another version of the Bible, you will see that the one I'm using is a modern translation, very accurate, and you will, I think, appreciate uh, its use in this program. So get that Bible and come join me here at the television. Just consider me to be a guest in your home and let's turn in your Bibles to the book of Ephesians. It's over in the New Testament. It's one of the letters of the Apostle Paul. One of the things that uh, characterizes the letters of Paul is that they were all written, of course, to specific destinations, as all letters are. Some were written to churches. Several were written to individuals like Timothy, Titus, and Philemon. This particular letter was probably written to churches in general. It's a very appropriate letter for any church to study at any time and has been a great blessing to the church throughout the centuries. Why? Well, because it contains a great deal of doctrine, a great deal of definitive teaching about God and about the Lord Jesus Christ, but it also contains so much practical stuff as well. It contains very down-to-earth practical instructions on how to live one's life. It contains the uh, guidelines for the various relationships, such as husbands and wives, children and parents, uh, employers and employees. It also explains a great deal that goes on in the world today that is normally inexplicable by science or reason or logic. 
because many people are growing to understand that there is a spiritual realm to life and that there are spiritual entities out there in the world that cannot be seen but whose influence is felt. Well, the chapter 6 of Ephesians talks about the warfare that we as God's people engage in with principalities and powers, not flesh and blood beings, but principalities and powers, fallen angels, demonic beings. So it's a fascinating letter on many accounts. But one very practical reason that I think that the letter is appropriate for all churches at all times is that as you look at the very beginning of the letter, uh, you uh, will see that in this New King James translation and in the Old King James translation, the first verse speaks this way. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God to the saints who are in Ephesus and faithful in Christ Jesus. Well, in the oldest manuscripts that we possess, it turns out that the words in Ephesus are not present, indicating that in the oldest copies of the letter, we have, in fact, a letter that was intended to be read by many churches, not just one congregation. And scholars have speculated that perhaps this was a circular letter that made the rounds of the churches in Asia Minor. The letter to the Ephesians has been called the Queen of the Epistles. It's been called by Samuel Taylor Coleridge, the poet, the divinest composition of man. It is a marvelous letter, and it begins with a marvelous sentence. Look in your Bibles at verse 3. Verse 3 is the beginning of a huge sentence that goes all the way to verse 14. In other words, as you read in verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. You're beginning a sentence that in the original Greek progresses and does not stop until the end of verse 14, where it says, Who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of His glory. Now you'll see that the New King James translators have broken up this long sentence into three sentences. Some uh, uh, translations break it up even further into five or as many as seven sentences. But uh, if, if you did anything less, it would really be too unwieldy to read. However, it is very much like the opening phrases of a mighty symphony. And I don't know if you've ever had a music appreciation class or not, but if you have, frequently in those kinds of classes, they'll have a huge um, uh, movement of a symphony, and they'll play a couple of moments of it, and then they'll say, now you notice that this is made up of several different phrases and motifs, and then they'll go back and they'll play you little clusters of notes so that you can hear what makes up the whole unified uh, movement. Well, the problem with that is, of course, that you're not listening to the whole unified movement as you're doing it. And when you go back, you have to put all this stuff together. Unfortunately, that's really the only way to show the complexity and sometimes the genius of various composers, and it's really the only way to show the greatness of this particular sentence. In a sense, this sentence probably was not meant to be analyzed with the thoroughness that we're going to do it. It was probably written to be read in a church. So on a Sunday morning, or probably more likely, a Sunday evening, people would come together and they would hear uh, someone read this letter to them. And perhaps the reading of the entire letter would take no more than 30 to 40 minutes. So it would probably take only three minutes or so, or even less, to read that entire first sentence. And you just didn't have time to really think in great detail and depth about all the phrases that Paul piled up. Why does he pile up phrases? Well, he piles up phrases because of passion, because of excitement, because 
he is rejoicing in his God. What kinds of things do you rejoice in? If I were to ask you today, what kind of things make you happy? What kind of things bring you joy? Maybe it's uh, being with friends, being surrounded by people that you love. Maybe it's uh, going out and having a really wonderful meal someplace. Perhaps it's taking a drive when the weather is beautiful and the scenery is nice. Perhaps it is listening to a really exhilarating and uh, thought-provoking piece of music like I've mentioned. Maybe it's seeing a really stirring film and uh, having your spirits lifted and your mind challenged by what you saw in the movie. Maybe it's the company of one particular person or being in a particular place or uh, spending hours at the keyboard of a particular computer. Whatever brings you joy is something that you care very deeply about. And I would guess that if we could talk personally and I got on the subject of what brings you joy, that then you would react very positively. Probably you would become a bit more animated than if I were talking to you about another subject. Your face would light up. You would be able to speak more about this particular subject and you would do so with delight. Maybe you would even love the subject so much and trust me so much that words would just come tumbling out of your mouth and they would be coming from the depths of your heart and you would be saying to me, I just love this new software because all, of it do, uh, all that it does, it does this and this and this. See, look at what you can do with that. Or you would tell me, I have the most wonderful wife or husband, or I have the most wonderful girlfriend or boyfriend, or I ate the most wonderful meal the other night at this particular restaurant, and then you'd be off telling me about all of the virtues of the software, the husband, the wife, the boyfriend, the girlfriend, or the restaurant. You see, that's what one normally does when one finds joy in something. Now, can you imagine finding joy in God. Can you imagine rejoicing in God so much that you would just want to praise Him with phrase upon phrase all piled up higher and higher until you were fairly gasping for breath? That is exactly what Paul is doing here. There is a, a description of Paul by one theologian that calls him God besotted. God besotted, or I think I got that wrong. It's Christ besotted. I believe that's the, that's the way I read the phrase. But in any event, he was besotted with the Lord. And that's what you see here. You see someone who is so enthusiastic. Now, you know, I, I hate to use uh, a phrase that has become hackneyed and worn out, on fire for God, but that is exactly what you find with this apostle. And it's not something that he has to work up. It's not something that he has to conjure up. It's not something that he has to get in the right frame of mind to express. It's just his state. He knows God so well and appreciates God so much that he cannot help but praise him with phrase after phrase and clause after clause until he ends in verse 14. That's truly amazing. And as I say to you, we've got to dissect this somewhat. We've got to look at phrase by phrase instead of just reading the whole thing and going on. Why, why should we do that? Isn't that perhaps a violation of Paul's intent or thought. Isn't that an injustice to this great apostle to do that to his writing? Actually, it's not. And the reason it's not is that whatever church he sent this to probably knew a bit more firsthand about what he was talking about than we do. And so we have to recover some of his uh, terminology. We have to figure out some of the phrases that come from uh, a background in Judaism and in the Old Testament. We have to uh, make sure that we appreciate and thoroughly understand what he's saying before we can fully comprehend the majesty and the grandeur of the entire sentence. If you look with me 
at verses um, 3 and 4, you'll see these words, or words very similar to them. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Essentially, the phrase means praise be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us. He's already done it. It's what they call the aorist tense in, Greece, in Greek. It's the uh, completed past tense. He blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. And we'll stop there for just a moment. Do you not see that first of all, the praises go to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. The, phra the uh, phrases of praise are directed to the one behind the sending of Jesus Christ into the world. Now, Jesus himself did in fact claim to be God. But he always kept a distinction between his Father and himself. Because you see, when we say that Jesus is God, we mean that Jesus is of the same essence as God and has the mind of God so that there is full agreement with him and God the Father. Furthermore, when we speak of the Holy Spirit, we also speak of someone distinct from the Father and the Son who also is God. He has the same essence as God, and He is every bit as divine as God the Father and God the Son. So are we talking about three gods? Absolutely not. In Judaism, out of which Christianity came, the Shema, that was recited by faithful Jews, went, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one God. The Jews were strict monotheists, and so are Christians. So were the Jewish Christians, the Jews who received Jesus as their Lord and Savior. But amazingly enough, they acknowledged that the one God was God in three somethings, three persons, three subsistences, but the same in essence. He was God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. It's a mystery, and a new word was coined to express it, named Trinity. But if you take any other position than that, you're not going to do justice to all the verses in Scripture that teach that the Father is God, Jesus is God, the Holy Spirit is God, the Father is not the Son. The Son is not the Spirit. The Spirit is not the Father. They are all separate and distinct, and yet they are all God, and Scripture teaches that there is only one God. Put all that data together, and you've got something called the Trinity. Well, this God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ sent Jesus Christ into the world, and what I want you to see is Jesus' central role. Because if you look over verses 3 and 4 very carefully, you'll see that these blessings that God gives us come to us in Christ at the end of verse 3. Then you'll see that God chose us in Him in verse 4 that we should be holy and without blame before Him, and I believe that that is before God, in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons, as we go into verse 5, by Jesus Christ to Himself, according to the good pleasure of His will, that is God again, to the praise of the glory of His grace, that's God the Father, by which He, God the Father, has made us accepted in the Beloved. That's Jesus. Now what I want you to notice is how many times in just these few verses Jesus is referred to and how all the blessings that God gives us are connected with Him. As a matter of fact, you can easily get the impression 
can you not? That God the Father does not bless us apart from Jesus Christ. And you know that would be consistent, wouldn't it, with what Jesus claimed. As little as you may know about Christianity, or as little as you may know about the Bible, surely you remember that one time Jesus made this statement, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now that's an amazing statement. You see, Jesus was far more than just a good teacher. Jesus was actually one who claimed to be God. Jesus was very careful. He did not leave us the option of simply calling him a good teacher. He claimed to be the one who brought the message of God into the world. He also claimed to be God by saying to uh, Philip, he who has seen me has seen the Father. Notice that's very different from saying, I am the Father. Instead, he said, he who has seen me has seen the Father. He was saying, if you want to know what your heavenly Father is like, observe me, hear my teaching, listen to my words, look at what I do, consider my attitude, ponder my ways. You will know what the Father is like by seeing me. Now, Jesus said, if you see me, you see the Father. Furthermore, he used the divine name, I am, on several occasions. One time he was walking on the water and they were afraid as they saw him from their storm-tossed boat and they cried out for fear and he said, be of good cheer, I am. It is I, is the way it's translated in uh, our English versions. But what he said in Greek was, I am. You remember when, he, when they came to arrest him in the Garden of Gethsemane, he said, whom do you seek? They said, Jesus of Nazareth. He said, I am he. Well, that translation is not quite accurate because it doesn't explain why everybody fell back to the ground. What Jesus said was, I am. And they recognized that he was doing uh, something that could uh, rightly be called blasphemy. He was actually taking to himself the divine name of God. He was calling himself Yahweh. He was actually referring to himself as the God of the Old Testament. Yet, as I say, he made this distinction between himself and the Father. He said, I always do the things that please the Father. He said, I am returning to my Father. He said, as, as he died on the cross, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Furthermore, the Father blessed his ministry by saying at his baptism, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And another time on the Mount of Transfiguration, he said, this is my beloved Son, hear him. So there is a distinction between Father and Son, yet both are the one God. And what these verses are saying is that God wants to make some sort of connection between people on earth, people who will read Ephesians, people who are being described in Ephesians, and Jesus. And the phrase that he uses is, in Christ. He's blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. And verse 4 says, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. What that means is that God is giving people blessings because they are connected to the one he loves. They are connected to his beloved son, Jesus. We will find, as we study this epistle in great detail, that God intends to pronounce people the way he pronounces Jesus to be. He regards us as vitally united and connected to Jesus Christ. This is the great doctrine that theologians have called union 
with Christ. Union with Christ. And you see it here uh, on uh, this first page of Ephesians. What does union with Christ mean? Well, it means that God in His grace has chosen to treat people, certain people, people who believe in Him, as if they were the best person who ever lived, as if they were Jesus Christ Himself. He has chosen to pronounce them the way Jesus is, perfectly righteous. He has chosen to give them the inheritance that he's going to give to Jesus. Joint heirs with Christ is a phrase that you find in another one of Paul's epistles, Romans in the 8th chapter. He has chosen to bless people with all the blessings that he gives to Jesus, even to the extent that one day we will be like Jesus in having glorified bodies. So, how does the Bible express this fact that we're united to Christ? Well, it does so in a number of ways. One way that it does it is in terms of a vine and branches off of that vine. Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. Uh, without me, you can bear no fruit. And I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bear fruit. You see, what he's saying is that we're vitally connected to him just as much as branches are connected to a vine. And just as the life of the vine spreads out and expresses itself through the branches, so we are connected to Jesus and we are to remain connected to him as a vine if we are ever going to hope to have his life in us. Another way that uh, union with Christ is expressed in Scripture is in this very epistle to the Ephesians. It's expressed in terms of a husband and wife and how they come together and they physically become one flesh and how their marriage makes them a new entity. And in the same way, Jesus is compared in Scripture to a bridegroom who loves his bride and seeks after his bride, takes care of his bride, and will eventually bring his bride home to him to have a huge wedding, what the Bible calls the marriage supper of the Lamb. These are ways in which Scripture expresses the fact that we are united with Jesus. But there's even more. In Paul's letter to Rome, the letter to the Romans, he speaks of our being crucified with Christ. He speaks of our being buried with Christ and the picture of that being baptism. He also speaks of us as being somehow raised to life with Christ. In other words, he's saying whatever happened to Jesus has happened to people who believe in him, has happened to people who trust in him. So. Paul actually goes so far as to say in Colossians chapter 3, you died. You died. Meaning that when Jesus Christ was cruelly crucified on the cross, that you died too if you're a believer in Him. That somehow you were so connected with Him as far as God was concerned that His death was your death. Now, what does that mean? Well, to get to the bottom of what that means, you have to ask yourself, what was Jesus really doing on the cross? Was he really just dying for something he believed in? Was he dying the death of a martyr? Was he showing us that God would even forgive the uh, cruelty of a crucifixion? No, none of those things. What he was doing on the cross was actually taking the wrath of God. Now, why is God angry? Why does the Bible present God? as being angry. Well, one thing that might be comforting to you is that the Bible never presents God as unjustly angry. The Bible never presents God as angry for the wrong reason. The Bible presents God as a just judge. And because God is a just judge, 
He's angry with the wicked every day. As a matter of fact, he told Moses in the book of Exodus that he would not leave any sin unpunished. He would by no means clear the guilty. And we expect that of a good, just, fair, faithful God. The question is, how are we going to have a relationship with this just, good, and faithful God if he's not going to clear the guilty and he's not going to leave any sin unpunished? I ask that question because I assume that you know that you have sinned against him. I assume that you know, if you know any of his commandments at all, that you have broken them, if not in deed, at least in thought. You and I are all sinners as we compare ourselves to God's perfection and as we look at the high standards of his commandments. So what are we going to do with a God who will not leave a sin unpunished and who will by no means clear the guilty? Obviously, we're going to have trouble facing such a God, and if such a God is just, he's going to send us into an everlasting state of punishment because of the exalted personage that he is. It would be one thing if someone came into uh, the studio here and was going to assassinate me. I have very little value. I am uh, made in the image of God, and therefore I have dignity and value in his sight. And so what the, mur what the murderer would do would be murder, and it would be an offense against God. But I'm sure you will agree that I'm not as valuable as the governor of the state. And if the governor of the state were in this studio and someone tried to assassinate him, then that crime would probably be reported and make the newspapers, where my murder would not. However, if the President of the United States were here in this chair doing a broadcast and someone came in and assassinated him, the nation would come to a standstill for a few days. There would be black-bordered newspapers. There would be type set in newspapers of the size called Second Coming Type, named after the Second Coming of Jesus. And people would consider it to be a tremendous and atrocious crime against humanity. Why? because of the value and status of the person that the crime was against. So you see, when you and I commit crimes against people, that's bad enough. But when the Bible presents every crime we commit as an offense against Almighty God, the maker of heaven and earth, the judge of all the earth, and the most exalted being in the cosmos, then you can understand why we are in great peril as sinners. What can be done when there is, as the Bible says, none righteous? No, not one. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. What are we going to do about a God who does not clear the guilty, who does not leave any sin unpunished? Well, thank God he has done something because there's nothing that we can do. God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son. He gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes on him should not perish meaning should not be punished with death and separation from God, but have everlasting life. Because what Jesus was doing on that cross was taking punishment. He was taking the wrath of God. That's why he was frightened before he went to the cross. That's why he prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane. And he prayed the same prayer three times. And the third time he prayed, his sweat was as great drops of blood falling to the ground. And God sent an angel to comfort him. Was Jesus less of a brave man than Socrates, who willingly drank his hemlock? No. 
Jesus had something more horrible to face than Socrates' mere death. Jesus had to face taking the wrath of Almighty God in place of sinners with whom God considered him to be united from all eternity. Union with Christ means Jesus came into the world as our representative substitute. As our representative substitute. What does your representative do for you? Your representative in the state capital. Your representative in the national capital. What does your representative do for you? Your representative votes and introduces bills that he or she thinks you in this district or this area would vote for or introduce if you had the chance. They try to represent you. We deal with representatives at all times, don't we? Let's imagine that I've got to pay my utility bill. So I go down to the grocery store to pay my utility bill. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. That doesn't compute. Why do I go to the grocery store to pay my utility bill? Because the utility company has authorized that grocery store to be an agency where the utility bill can be paid. Well, let me ask you this. If the bill is in my name and yet my wife, who's a signatory on the joint account, pays for it and she takes the check to the grocery store and the check is signed in her name, have I paid my bill? Have I paid my bill? Well, yes, I've paid my bill. How did I do it? I paid it through my representative. My representative took the money. Now, let me ask you one more question. What if my wife works at the grocery store as a duly authorized representative of the utility company? Yet she also lives in my home. Can she write a check to the utility company and receive that check for the utility company? Can she be an agent for me and an agent for the utility company at the same time? Of course she can. My friends, what Jesus Christ was was an agent for his people and for God at the same time. They call such a person in Scripture a priest, one who is a bridge builder between God and people. He represented his people on behalf of God, on behalf of his people. He represented God on behalf of God. And when he was dying on the cross, the God-man was taking the wrath of God and God the Father was considering him to be the representative of his people, bearing their penalty, taking their punishment, receiving the wrath due to them. And that is why he can uphold his reputation as one who does not leave any sin unpunished because he has punished the sins of his people. Not in them personally, but in their representative, Jesus Christ on the cross. Furthermore, Jesus didn't stay dead. He did not stay dead. Three days later, he rose from the dead because it was not possible for the grave to hold him. Why? because he really was perfect. And because he didn't have to satisfy the wrath of the Jews, he didn't have to satisfy the wrath of the Romans, the wrath he had to satisfy was the wrath of God. And when he satisfied the wrath of God, God raised him to life. God raised him up on the third day. And he conquered death, and he showed that the atonement worked because if Jesus had had any sin in him, 
he would have stayed dead. But he didn't stay dead. He rose again. And what does Paul say in Romans 6 about us and that resurrection? He says that as we have been buried in the likeness of his death, we also should be in the likeness of his resurrection. In other words, Paul compares the Christian life to being like the life of someone who has come back from the dead. All of this is to say that God has put Jesus into the world for us who believe on him to be united to him so intimately and so thoroughly that we're like a wife to a husband, we're like branches to a vine, we are like a people represented to their representative. Have you ever noticed that when ambassadors sign trade agreements with another country, why, here we all are doing business with that other country according to the trade agreement the ambassador signed. And you can say, well, I didn't sign the agreement. But the point is, you were there in the ambassador. He had the authority to speak for you. And you were in him as far as that country was concerned. Well, in just the same way, you and I are in Christ according to the teaching of Scripture. And I want to stress that at the very beginning because Paul is going to be talking about this and you're going to have to understand that every blessing you and I ever receive comes through the mediation of Jesus Christ. And notice in verse 4 that God chose us in Him before the foundation of the world. In other words, the people who are Christians, the people who know Jesus Christ and as their Lord and Savior, were chosen for that blessing. They were chosen in Christ long before they were even born, centuries before they ever came to be. They were chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. You see, the plan of God has always been because God has always been. The plan of God is because God is. And the plan of God is all connected with this God-man, Jesus Christ, and those who are His. Take your Bible for just a moment and turn over to the 17th chapter of the Gospel of John. This is a most profound chapter. Jesus is praying to his Father the night before he goes to the cross. And I'd like for you to look at some of the phrases in his prayer with me. Jesus spoke these words, it says in John 17, 1. He lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son that your Son also may glorify you as you have given him authority over all flesh. Notice that Jesus has the ultimate control and sovereignty over everybody. I, I hope that doesn't disturb you too much, that Jesus has ultimate authority and sovereignty over you. Why do you think you're watching this broadcast? Why, with all of the other things that you could be doing right now, maybe other things that you intended to do today, maybe even with an aversion to religious broadcasts on your part, you're watching this. Could it not possibly be that God has arranged that? Could it not possibly be that God is dealing with you? Maybe He's been dealing with you for some time and you have been trying to shut that voice out and ignore Him but maybe this is one of those catalytic moments. Certainly God has ordained that I should be speaking to you right now, whoever you are and wherever you are, because Jesus Christ has authority over all flesh. So whatever is happening to me is under Jesus' authority. And whatever happens to you 
is under Jesus' authority. But look at the next phrase in verse 2. That he, meaning God, I'm sorry, that, that Jesus, excuse me, that he, meaning Jesus, should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. To give eternal life to as many as you have given him. Now that's the very same idea that we found in Ephesians, that we were chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. In other words, before Jesus ever came to earth, God had given Jesus some people. You've given him authority over all flesh, all people, that he should give eternal life to some people, as many as you have given him. Why, you may ask, isn't he going to give eternal life to everybody? Well, we read in Scripture that there will be a hell. And we read in Scripture that it will be populated. And it will be full of people who hate God and who hate Jesus Christ and who resist and rebel against God. It will be full of people who, on the surface of things, may be very nice and polite, but deep down inside in their inmost being, they despise God. They don't want Him to reign over them. And so they will get their wish. They will go as f to the place as far separated from God as any place can be, except they will find to their dismay that He also is present there. But they would still rather be in everlasting pain and torment than to bend their knee to Him and bow before Him and call Him Lord. You've all known people like that, haven't you? Maybe you've been like that to a certain extent. People who would rather give up everything, lose everything, than stop a destructive relationship or cease from a self-destructive kind of behavior. They pick the thing they love, and they don't care what happens to them in the pursuit of that thing. Well, in just the same way, there will be people who go to hell. So the Bible speaks not of everyone being given to the Lord Jesus Christ, but those that God has given Him. And we don't know how many they are, and we don't know who they are, but whoever they are, Jesus will give eternal life to them. Keep looking there in John 17, now the third verse. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Now here's the definition of eternal life. Knowing God. Knowing God. Knowing God the Father and Jesus Christ. Anybody who does not know God the Father and Jesus Christ does not have eternal life. It's just that simple. Now, what's eternal life? Is that merely living forever? No, because you will live forever. You've already got that blessing or curse, as it may be, of living forever. Every single being lives forever. Every single human being keeps on existing, even after death. Even after the body decays, the spirit goes somewhere, the soul goes someplace, and the body waits for the time of the general resurrection, both of the just and the unjust. In the meantime, you go on living. The difference is in who you live for and who you know while you live. What Jesus says here, is that eternal life is knowing. And that means having an intimate relationship with. That Bible word, know, when you encounter it, do remember this, it so often means far more than just recognizing somebody or knowing about somebody. It actually means intimate knowledge. It is, in fact, the word that was used for sexual relations. You remember that uh, it says that 
uh, Adam knew his wife, and she brought forth a son. And uh, Joseph did not know Mary till after she had brought forth her firstborn son. So what Jesus is saying here is that the definition of eternal life is no longer being dead to God. It is now being alive to God, calling God your Lord, confessing that Jesus Christ is Savior and Lord, and turning from that which displeases God to that which pleases Him, trusting Him by faith and knowing Him personally. That's what's involved in eternal life, not just existing forever, because all of us will exist forever. Eternal life has to do with the quality of our life, with knowing God as our Lord and King. This is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Now, the interesting thing about this is that Jesus says that these people who will know eternal life have been given to him and he says, I have glorified you on the earth, John 17, 4. I have finished the work which you've given me to do. And now, O oh Father, glorify me together with yourself with the glory which I had with you before the world was. He had glory with God before the world was. I'd like you to skip down to the end of the prayer. Look at verse 20 of John 17. I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. Could that be you? Because Jesus is praying for future generations of people who will believe in him. That they all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you. That they also may be one in us. There's that union again that the world may believe that you sent me. And the glory which you gave me, I have given them, that they may be one just as we are one. I and them, that's Jesus dwelling inside people by his Spirit, and you in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that you've sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. Wait a minute. At the end of verse 23, there is an amazing statement that's easy to skip over. God loved people, sinful, rebellious, defiant people who hated him and would have murdered him if they could. He loved them as much as he loved Jesus. This God, who is the judge of all the earth and who will by no means clear the guilty, must also be a God of incredible, unfathomable love. He must also be a God of incredible and limitless mercy. If he could love people not worth loving as much as he loved the only person that was ever worth his loving. You think of who you love. Most of them are worth it for some reason or other. Maybe the reason is known only to you, but they're worth it. This is saying that God loves people who are not worth it out of His sheer grace and loves them as much as He loves Jesus. So here's Jesus' plan for them. And I'll finish John 17 and quickly run back to Ephesians 1. Father, I desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me where I am, that is, in heaven with him, that they may behold my glory which you have given me, for you loved me before the foundation of the world. You see how far all this goes back? God loved the Son before the foundation of the world. God gave people to the Son before the foundation of the world, whom he also loved as much as he loved the Son. And Paul tells us in our first chapter of Ephesians that God chose these people before the foundation of the world to be a certain way in the world. We're going to look at what that way is in just a moment. Last two verses of John 17. O righteous Father, 
The world has not known you, but I have known you, and these have known that you sent me. And I have declared to them your name, and will declare it, that the love with which you loved me may be in them and I in them. All of these are verses about our union with Christ and God. Turn back quickly in closing now to Ephesians 1, 4. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should simply be saved from wrath, that we should simply go to heaven and not go to hell. No, there's more. That we should be holy and without blame before him. Next time we're together, we're going to look extensively at that phrase, without blame before him. But be holy means separate. It means living a life pleasing to him. How do you start living a life pleasing to him? You say, Father, I want to know you through Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I invite all of you to begin to seek the Lord while he may be found, to understand that maybe this broadcast was no accident in your life. Start seeking the Lord today. I'm Jackson Boyette for Dayspring Chapel at 55th and Avenue G. Of course, we invite you to come and join us for worship. Keep reading the Bible. And we'll see you again in this place on this station next time. Until then, the Lord be with you. Check out our websites, BibleQuery.org. This site answers 7,700 Bible questions. HistoryCart.com. This site reveals early church history and doctrine proving Roman Catholicism is not historically or doctrinally viable. MuslimHope.com. This site is a classic refutation of Islam, a counterfeit religion created by Muhammad. Free newsletters are also available. 